by joining us, Leslie Gale. You got your jumpsuit on, are you, Leslie? <laughs> Hello, Regan. How are you? Yeah, I'm missing jumping so much. We're in lockdown here in the UK, so I thought I'd put my jumpsuit on just to just to get in the mood. I've got and a brand new one here. Yeah. Give, give a big shout out to my sponsors. I've got a brand new jumpsuit with my sponsors on. I should be wearing it as well. Yeah, next time. <laughs> next time. Leslie, like you just said, we'll just have a little chat. We're normally together, aren't we, this time of year? We're normally in Spain, normally in Imperia Brava at Wind Games for the last, I don't know, five, six, seven years. Yeah, all the photos keep popping up on Facebook and it makes me a bit sad that we're not there, but oh. onwards and upwards, we just have to look forward to next year. How are you coping with all this rubbish? Um, my house is incredibly clean and I've got <laughs> I've got round to doing all those jobs that you mean to, to do. You know, when you decorate a room and you leave that last little bit, I'm yeah. doing all of that stuff. I'm nearly running out now though. I'm, I'm about <laughs> to go out, back out in the world. We're similar in a way though, because we've got online work. I mean, you've got the skydivemag.com and that's obviously a big workload for you. The content you put out is incredible. There's so much stuff. Thank you. Yes, I mean, the, uh, the only thing that's changed for me really is not going to not going to drop zones and not being able to go and hug my family. Um, you know, I, I spend all day here at, at home on the computer anyway, so that's not so different. And I'm, at least I can work from home. Where are you, Leslie? Whereabouts in the UK are you? In Peterborough, just just ten minutes away from Sibson Drop Zone. And where are you from originally? Uh, well, born in Scotland and then brought up in the northeast of England, which is when I met you many many years ago. Yeah. And uh, yeah, moved to Peterborough. Uh, moved to be to, to Peterborough to uh, to be close to the Drop Zone. Actually, it makes me laugh because that's such a great plane. It was an islander. <laughs> <laughs> Because I come from a Cessna drop zone, so to be able to get nine people in one aircraft was amazing. Now you probably couldn't pay me to get in an island of it. Remember the first time um, I went in an islander? I think it might have been a Black Knights at Cockrum, and they had one in it for the weekend of, for some reason or other. It was, the door was open. I don't even think there was a door. And uh, as we were taking yeah. off, just watching this wheel, and it was just firing cow pats at me. <laughs> 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 Come from, yeah, I, did that. <laughs> I didn't know you were born in Scotland. Whereabouts? Uh, Cote Bridge, Glasgow. And then oh, all my how long were you there for? Uh, we moved down when I was a kid, when I was about four or something. So I very quickly lost a Scottish accent because kids are cruel. Um, but yeah, all my family's Scottish. Well, my grandparents, you know, all my ancestors. We used to go up there, uh, you know, we used to go up there every holiday. So you very, you proud, very proud, you independent you people, Scots. Where you went to? Sorry. Was it Durham you went to? Yeah, Durham University, and uh, yeah, that's where I was uh, brought up. Beautiful place. So, what about before skydiving? Were you into any other sports at school or at uni? Or Gymnastics was my big thing at school, right. which you can tell now because I, I do have a big, a good arch. If I say it myself, <laughs> uh, it's been commented on many, many times, Mrs. Bendy, and, 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 and I mean, flexibility definitely helps for skydiving. It's just deflecting physics, isn't it? It's, it's just deflecting air. So, the most, uh, the more flexible you are, I think, the more range you have. How did you do in gymnastics? I think I got a couple of badges, I think. Oh yeah, badges and stuff, to this. <laughs> but yeah, but I wasn't, uh, uh, skydiving is the first day sport I've been really good at, to be honest. I loved sport at school. I could never understand those kids that used to rub soap in their eyes to just to avoid the games lesson. You think, this is the best time of the week, you know, I'm really looking forward to it. But I really wanted to excel in some sport and I was okay, you know, I wasn't terrible. I wasn't that kid that was picked last, but I didn't really shine at anything. And for some reason, when I started skydiving, it just, it just clicked. Well, it certainly has to be over a hundred competition medals. You've been in, let me just check, 20, 20 records worldwide. You've coached and been part of that. In fact, I think the picture behind me, this was the Impura Brava, Impura Brava Challenge. And uh, uh, you're on that, are you somewhere? Yes, I remember that. Yeah. That was a wonderful weekend, that. That's the way you are there. But you, you, you've, you know, you've been at the forefront of British skydiving. Since I started, I started in 1990. And you've always been there with those I remember those iconic teams on the front page of the mag there was a was it record cameras and was it mind games were you part of those as well no i wasn't part of uh rico cameras or, or mind games mind games had a specific policy which meant no women were included <laughs> <laughs> no women were included that's that's, that's a good that's the god's honest truth of it wow. um, but no I've, I've done many eight-way teams um you know arm but chicks and uh, several world meets I remember, I remember like back in the nineties, or like seeing you there and at competitions and stuff. You, you were just all this kind of higher level of British skydiving. It was just incredible to watch. You were like national heroes. But let's go back a bit further. When did it 
come into your mind skydiving when we when did you become aware of it well when i went to university uh, i wasn't aware before that, that that skydiving was a sport uh, i remember when i was a kid about about nine seeing a demo and people jumping into finkel abbey with power commanders what i now recognize um and i just thought it was the coolest thing i'd ever seen those guys with the red devils so i just thought that it was a whole military thing i didn't think that you know people could just go and do it for fun and then when i, when I went to university i saw a sign saying parachute jumps, no strings attached. Uh, that was at the freshest fair, you know, when you, you, you go and all they're all trying to, you know, say join the canoe club, join the tennis club, join the knitting club or, or whatever. So I joined the, the, the free fall club and did my first jump very quickly. And as soon as I did the first jump, walked straight through all the people chattering about how great it was, put my name back on the board to do another one. Did three jumps that day. Went wow. back the next weekend and then cleared to free fall and yeah, sort of wow. whiz to the system, about 42 jumps in the category system as it was there. There was no AFF, there was no tandem. Where was that? Where was your drop on? Uh, that was Sunderland Airport, which is now a, a Nissan car factory that closed um, just uh, shortly before I got my Cat 8 actually. So I found just love and then it closed, but that was all instrumental and we moving down to, to Peterborough, so, you know. What, what year was that, that when you were first started? 1984, around about that time, maybe 83, 84. So would it have been, I take it it was rounds, was it? Yes, yes, first uh, first jump was on a C9 with a, a front round reserve and then uh, early free fall on, on, on TUs and uh, then, yeah, it was just, squares had just come in. So my first rig with the square in had a round reserve because in those days, people thought it was too dangerous to jump with a square <laughs> in your energy reserve. Yeah, what was it they used to say? Round is sound, but square gets there. <laughs> like that. So what, this first jump you did, you went straight and put your name down. Why, why was that? What was it about it which made you think, I'm doing another one right away? I just, I just felt like I was home. Yeah. Uh, it, it's like in the plane, you're terrified. And there's all that noise and, you know, it, I mean, that was actually the first time I'd ever been in a plane. I'd never flown, mm -hmm. you know, deprived childhood and all that. So to go in the first time in the plane and it, it's got a great big, because there was no door, like you said, in those days, it was just a big hole. And that's a bit, you know, weird. And you're going up and there's all the wind and noise and everything. And then, you know, I kind of thought, well, I got the plane. Well, I'm, I'm really scared, but they said I'm going anyway. So I'm just going to pretend that, that I'm not, you know, and, and then got in the door and just, just, oh, I can remember it now. It's just so peaceful. I mean, that was static lines. So your parachute opens straight away and a round is completely different from a main. You mean a square makes loads of noise. It's all flapping. Have you ever jumped around? Yeah, I did my cut yeah. rounds. So yeah. I, I so, you know, it's, it's, it's just all like peace. You, yeah. you know, you just feel so tranquil. And yeah, I just felt like I'd come home and that's what I wanted to do. For me, I remember that specifically being in the plane, how noisy it was and how frantic it was. It was just just assaulting the senses, so the noise, the wind, everything. And then once you're under that round parachute, how quiet it was. It was just a massive switch from going from intense to just suddenly being in the, in the sky. How crazy is that? You're, you're hanging in the sky in silence. Crazy. Yeah, and, it, and it's still the same in a way. You know, you go to a world record and you, you, you've got all these constant, you know, you've got to concentrate and focus and you're in your plane trying to focus and, you know, get your mind in a complete headspace and visualise perfection and all that stuff. And then as soon as you leave the plane, it's like I'm just flying. I'm just in my element. I don't have to, like, really think, you know, and, and it's like that contrast between this very busy head and then just being extremely clear it's like all that noise and your head goes away so i feel like so you did those three jumps on the on the first day you went back got cleared for free fall how long did you spend there in sunderland how many jumps did you do before you moved on um about 30 something like that it closed it closed then and then i went and jumped at pampersford and finished my uh, my course uh, you know finished my category eight off off there and then if you ever jumped there amazing place in george in uh, cambridgeshire yeah yeah, legendary. <laughs> legendary British. <laughs> when I started at Tilstock, everybody, this was 1990, everybody was talking about Panther so it had this kind of fairy tale um, feeling to it. It was a, the place that everybody had just come from uh, Colin Fitzwarris, Lynn George, and all those people. But were you working at the time, Leslie? Yes. Uh, no, I was, at, I was at university. I, I did my, you know, I. I, I um, 
got my category A, you know, everything while I was still at university and then carried on jumping. Um, what did you do at uni? Chemistry. <laughs> never, never used it, but <laughs> I think I just told me I don't want to do this anymore. Thank you. <laughs> so now you're at Pampas Food, you're jumping there, you're still at uni. What happens next? You, you finish uni and what happens then? Yeah, finished uni, did, uh, then I got a wing walking job for the Hugo Cars Flying Circus. So that was a that was a great job for a year going around standing on the top of a, a Boeing steer and biplane waving at people. That was that was great. I loved that. Um, then I left that to do more skydiving really because it was great but that was every weekend in the summer. So I started taking my jumping more seriously, did a few different um, jobs in one in publishing sold sponsorship of educational publishing and then applied for the job uh, for the BPA magazine. They were uh, advertising for an editor and they were advertising it was something like two grand a year as a part time job. But as I basically went in, shuffled around the budget, you know, bought things more economically and squeezed my way into a little full time role. And then when I got that job, that was uh, that was as I felt when I first got into Freefall, like I'm home. I, I, this is I belong here when you know, when I got that job running your BPA magazine, I felt like I found my vocation. This is, I, I'm so passionate about my sport and here I get a chance to, to pass on my passion, keep other people excited, share really important safety information, you know, and, and then I've been in publishing ever since. Yeah, it was, when I started, you were, I think you were already the editor of the, of the, of the magazine, of the British Parachute Association magazine. 1996 was my first magazine. So who was doing it before you then? Was it Sam? Ola, Ola Soyinski. Right. Yeah, but before me, it was a volunteer position. And I think it, it, there's a there's a limit to how much you can do, you know, if you're doing, if you're doing it for nothing. And, uh, you know, the magazine's changed since then because it, it's it, it put it on a professional, you know, on a more professional level. We'll come back to the magazine in a minute. I want to go back to this wing walking. How did that come about? How did you find yourself doing that? Well, about three people contacted me and said that they'd seen uh, something in the BPA mag, strangely enough, said, and they said, this sounds like your job. And uh, and I read it and I was like, yes, this is definitely my job. And I rang the guy, Vic Norman, and, and he said, oh, you're too late. Um, you know, uh, the position's closed. I said, oh, you've chosen somebody then. He said, no, well, we got it down to the final three. And I said, well, obviously, you know, George style, you remember George Pokington, you know, that kind of guy. Well, obviously, if you got it down to the final three, then you're not very sure, are you? Because if you if you did know who you wanted, you'd have made a final choice. What about I come and see you and then I might just slide into the, the final four? And that's exactly what happened. I, I went down there to see him and uh, and then it went down the next day for the uh, or a week later or something for the interview with the other girls and, and and got the job which was all quite funny because before that in order to get to that point they'd all gone to Aldershot and done loads of rolling around in the mud and obstacle courses and all sorts of horrible stuff that I didn't have to do so, but yeah that was a that was a great job loved it did you tour the country with it or was it in one place no, we, yeah, we toured the country. The, the biplane was based at uh, Duxford in, in Cambridge. And so Bob and I would arrive there and, and push the plane out the hangar. You know, it all seems very gremlous, but there's a lot of there's a lot of donkey work involved with it as well. You know, and then we'd fly off to somewhere. Uh, generally, we'd fly off and then land and then do the display the next day. And generally, we when we were flying somewhere, then I would be in the in the um, you know in the cockpit. Um, but sometimes we had we sometimes we had to take off and go because we needed an air, a, a runway to take off. So if you're doing a show and say like maybe some little town fair, you know, a festival or something, they don't have a runway. Then we take off from somewhere else with me on the wing and fly along there the whole time with me on my wing, which is really really good fun. I remember one time we were flying along like the white cliffs of Dover. So there's people walking their dogs along along the top, and, and they look over and they can't see Bob because because he's kind of flying like, yeah, they just see this girl like <laughs> waving to the below. <laughs> Surprising they didn't come off the sides, really. <laughs> yeah. Oh, brilliant. Oh, that's so funny. So you're at the mic, you've started with the magazine, you're editing that, you've got a full-time job. Have you started competing yet in Skydive? Yeah, when I took over the, the editor, then yes, I was already doing a, a, a lot of competition. It just started in small ways, you know, was at Langer, jumping, and just a little, you know, launching accuracy meet as it was in those days, or, you know, that late-way speed contest. And, and I just, 
found that I, that I liked it. And then I got my big break when Rob Colpus asked me to join the, the Symbiosis 16 way team. And that was fabulous. Went all around, all around Europe and all around UK. We, we won everything apart from when we entered the, um, the world meet and then we got uh, took it to a pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, and that just really gave me a taste for competition. It wasn't something that I'd ever seen myself doing at the beginning, but I found that I really enjoyed it. It's that whole team thing, traveling together, getting getting somewhere, putting all your, you know, your focus on celebrating together, you know, at the end of it. Yeah. So and you then that same way led, you know, just then I wanted to sort of move faster. So then started doing a four way and eight way. Yeah. Eight way became your thing for quite a while, didn't it? Yes, I love eight way. It's, it's just that little bit, Oh, it can be a bit frantic and, and and it's all go, go, go. I think eight way when eight ways really going, it's absolutely beautiful. You know, different, I think it's just so much more varied. You've got, you know, some of the blocks, you've got four two ways, some of them you've got two three ways and two singles, you know, some of them two four ways. And the, the different, you know, there's blocks like the diamond diamond where you, you take two compressed diamonds and you spin them around each other, you know, vertical and over the top. That's, that's really good, good fun. And then was it am i right on the timeline with another project with inversion 66 yes inversion 66 was in about 1998 i think that was with stumpy care of uh rotty yeah. chappy the usual suspects that, that was an eight-way team wasn't it yes and the, the plan was going for the 99 yes but we we didn't make that as, as so often happens you have a dream goal but you, but you don't make it uh the junction junction something uh got that instead but then a little while a little while later i got my first chance to go to a world meet with om and we'd actually we'd come second in the nationals because by this time i got to a point of just throwing a few uh, throwing a scratch team together for the nationals and and generally we go and get second place you know different in those days the standard wasn't wasn't quite you know you didn't have to train so hard is, is, is what i'm saying but basically we got second um but the team that had won i think it was pete allen's uh a team that he'd you know put together he was doing four way and and eight way so they didn't want to go or whoever it was didn't want to go and and so we went instead that was croatia world Meet 2004. when was the first time you went and did any training in a tunnel in a wind tunnel oh that would be where was it as well yeah around about the same sort of time or around about then and that was in orlando i remember i wanted to join um the arizona challenge because kate stevens told me that she said oh you'd love this event i was like yeah but it's invitational how do you get invited she said well you write and ask and i was like oh i didn't think of doing that <laughs> you mean you can invite yourself <laughs> so i emailed jack jeffries saying hello <laughs> i'd like to join your party <laughs> And then he sort of sent me back um, a kind of like, very well, you know, you've got to be really good. Come on, send me all your, you know, what's your averages and blah, blah, blah. So I sent him back all the details and he kind of came back with a very begrudging, well, you know, you haven't really got the standard that we want, but my, my colleagues think a lot of you. So, but, so we'll have you, but you better be on your game. I was like, OK, I'm going to be on my game. So I, I sorted out to go to Florida before I went there uh, and to go, and, to go in the tunnel and get some coaching and at the time I was flying in a great big box position because that's what we did then and basically I did a load of um, getting up at two o'clock in the morning I don't know why it was like that in Orlando but it always was you get yeah. up at two o'clock in the morning going over four o'clock in the morning and over a course of a week he coached me and just completely changed my body position you know into the, the mantis position pretty well that I've, that I've got now with a few other variations that you, that you learn over the years but yeah it's all about body position and starting from a, a good body position is is really the key to being a great skydiver you know in whatever orientation that you are so tell me about your brick chicks project where did that come from and what was it brick chicks the because there was two brick chicks projects there was brick chicks the female records and then there was brick chicks the eight-way team let's, Which talk, one about you want to know about? let's talk about the record first the record. Well, I've been doing quite a bit of big way. I've been on national records. I've been in world records and stuff. And and uh, Erica, you know Erica Richardson. Do you remember her? She's a long time jumper. She said to me, "Did you know, Leslie? It's about time we need." Uh, another female record in in the uk it's been too long and i said you're absolutely right erica and she says and it should be organized by a woman because they're always organized by men and it's patronizing and i was like you're absolutely right erica and she went and you're the woman for the job and i was like oh oh <laughs> and i was 
something about it, I thought, well, yeah, you know, in all honesty, I was the most experienced big way organiser, female, in the UK, and I thought it should be organised by a woman, so let's give it a go. So I contacted my friend Kate Stevens, and uh, and she was brilliant, and we just put a plan together, and basically started off, did some workshops, went around, uh, went around the country, coaching in small groups, uh, this, uh, and then we had an event at Langer um, in May, and then another event at the end of the year, I think in September, and it's still the only record event in the world which is completely non-invitational. Is that well, everyone's invited. It's not a closed invite. So all, all female skydivers living in the UK, you know, or even in the end, we were taking people from abroad if they wanted to come. You know, they're all welcome to come and throw the hat in the ring, and we will take the best you know, the best group that we can every time that we think has got the best chance of getting us a record. So we got a 40 way and 50 way in 2002, we got a 60 way 2004, 68 way Red Cross, there it is, <laughs> uh, in 2007. And then 2013, we actually built a 70 way butterfly, but not all the grips were joined up. So you can't call it an official record, but it was still, a bridge six butterfly over the it was beautiful as well you thank know. you <laughs> yes i like picture formations i think they're very easily understandable to the general yeah. to the general public it definitely helps get our sport out into the into the media did the media pick that up did you get yes the yes yes, the yes big time well uh, the the link with the red cross came because they wanted to promote um their every most of the big charities have a charity week so they wanted to, to do a big thing for their charity week and they actually wanted us to build the british record and then jump into hyde park afterwards <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so we, we managed to sell them on the idea of well we do the record here when you get a load of publicity out of that and then we'll do a jump into hyde park which we also did you know which was amazing uh, and they were very very happy they they said that they had an roi return on investment of 10 you know so for every pound that they spent they you know they got 10 pounds worth of of great publicity and, and support for the cause because what they wanted to promote was that people think of the red cross they often think of the little old ladies doing their knitting that run the shops and they yeah. don't think about all the young um go getting females that go all the way around the world going into you know terrible areas earthquakes you know bombs military uh, you know, disaster areas and going and patching up the wounded. The average age of people that, that join the Red Cross, most of them are female, and the average age is about 30. So they really wanted to promote that side. So it so it worked for them as well. And then the did the eight-way team come from that, the British eight-way? Uh, it just came, I started, I was carrying on doing eight-way, and then I noticed, I was noticing that the the because I was doing these scratch teams and getting second, and then the the team that were winning, which was various comp, it was V and E for, for many years, but then basically the same people, but you know, called different th th with a different names, will take it and that sort of stuff. But they would always take the I'd find some new talent, and then for my scratch team, I'd always pick up somebody that, and then like, oh yeah, we'll have him. So I was like, mm, I think I might just form an old female team and then you'll have to take some women on your team, won't you? <laughs> and so it, it started off um, with joining with members of, of... Well, the other reason as well was because I thought if I do an all female team, it goes back to tunnel because at the time we had the body flight tunnel in the UK, 16 foot, and that was the largest tunnel in the world. And I figured that eight women could actually do some reasonable eight way in the tunnel and that worked very well. So several years in a row, then I did a plan, we went and did two nights tunnel in the week. So I generally take the, the, the women that have been doing four way the previous weekend at the Nationals, put a nice little eight way team together, a couple of nights of tunnel just to learn the blocks and then go up and fingers crossed the exit would work. That's always the, 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 the big thing. So we've done this a number of years and, and got second and then it was kind of a similar thing. Then the team that won didn't want to go well, no, we just, it wasn't, yeah, we just got to a point we wanted to take it more, we wanted to take it further. I think the, the four-way team that I'd picked up that year, you know, the girls' four-way team, they hadn't qualified to go to the world meet as the, as the female four-way team, so they were available. And we said, well, you know what, we were doing pretty well as a scratch team, why don't we, why don't we train? 
and and so uh, and so when then we did a, did a few training camps with Kirk Werner at, at Paracletes in Rayford, um, and the following year with uh, with Marco. Well, Marco was doing our tunnel training here and things, and then also did, did some with Martial. So we put a few years training into that. Still didn't win, but we, but we did get our goal our goal average, and we did make them go and train harder in order to have to beat us. If you see what I'm saying, <laughs> still got to go to a world meet in the end. I'm happy. Well, you, you've kept yourself right at the forefront with sharp skills over the last 35 years. You really have done that. What do you think it is mentally which keeps you wanting to be at the uh, Leading edge. I, look, I, I like to go. I, I like to feel sharp. I don't want. To, I don't want to be in a jump thinking I'm not very. I'm not really on it. You, you know. I can feel the difference when you have a layoff and you start jumping just at the beginning of the year, because that's what we do over here. <laughs> then you know I can feel that I'm rusty and I don't like that. If I'm doing something, I, I want to do it really well so i've always wanted to stay on the sharp end and i think the thing is that the sport has progressed so much in such a short time you know if you look at the short time that i've been doing it all the different disciplines that have come in you know we didn't have vfs competitions there wasn't even any head down you know there weren't canopy piloting competitions there wasn't sky surfing you know all of these fascinating developments have come in but also you know looking at the, the way that the whole sports progressed in that time in in formation skydiving as well i think that the world record when i started was probably about 50 you know now it's 400 we didn't have a head down record now it's 164 and so what i'm saying is it, it, you need to, in skydiving, you need to be always working on your skills because if you're not, the sport will go past you and and you'll be you'll be on the shelf before you know it. You know. <laughs> I read somewhere that you said the 400 way, which just had its 15 year anniversary, was your your favourite skydiving. It was epic. Just the whole the whole event was epic. Getting to Thailand, taking over the whole Windsor Suites with 400 skydivers from all over the world. You can imagine going on a tuk tuk race with all of us, you know, around town. Once we got into the air, the base. I mean, it was like this contrast between utter tedium and real excitement because we got there in the morning. It's seven o'clock in the morning. We didn't know when we were going to be able to jump. It was not like we had any manifest, and so you sit around all day. Mostly, we did two jumps, and generally, you know, it'd be like one in the morning and then one in the afternoon, just when you'd lost the will to live. And now you just have to pull out, you know, your, your world record performance. And that contrast between sitting around doing nothing, trying to keep yourself entertained because there's nothing there you know and so you come up you have all these all these jokes are going on between the camps and the nations you know you can you can imagine it and then between that and having these five hertz to play with i mean when they came up the, the noise and the heat and the fumes as they arrived i cannot i'm getting goosebumps just talking about it i cannot possibly tell you how that felt like and then you sit on these in a hard wooden floor for 45 minutes till you get up to altitude, you know, and you get up, you're all stiff and everything, and then they open that tailgate. You know, it's like it's like maybe when people die and they see that light, you know, yeah. and they want to go towards that light. You're like, let me out of there. And then just running down, you know, can you imagine? Because I always want to like, get the back. So you're running down as Hercules, you know, you've got 80 people running and you're trying to get close like this. I mean, the first thing that happens, you get up and they sort of compress right up and your oxygen tubes all slide up. And, and it's incredible how 80 people just suddenly compress yeah. like into half. And then they start running and you're running and just trying to uh, protect your um, self, go square onto the slipstream. And not tumble and then getting out diving 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 i have never dived like that in my life i mean you just die you can't see anything when you go out you, you know no sign of a base you're just diving and diving and, and diving and then you come into this approach and the thing was so big and enormous and it's going around like this it's like it's like it was a mother it's like it was this giant octopus it just had this life of its own i cannot possibly describe how just enormous it was you know really really enormous and then and then you, you you go away to track and then you start tracking and i'd managed to score myself a tracking pull out slot because daryl rang me up to talk about the slots and he had me first right in the mid right in the in one of the front uh, lines being an anchor so then i've got 40 people hanging off me i think I'm, i don't really like this my body weight isn't great for this so by the end of it I've talked to him into moving a few people forward and I've scored myself a slot right at the back and the tracking pullout slot because you really think 400 people 
I'm not too sure about all these canopies, how that's going to go, but this was the first year ever that tracking pullouts were done. BJ Worth has just invented some incredible uh, things in his time and tracking pullouts. So we would leave and everybody else is going away in tracking teams. We would leave and instead of trying to get out as far as possible, we're going up, 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 just get up and about seven seconds, then you jump, you have the smoothest opening ever because you, 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 you know, you're, you're really, sad. and then I've just got these incredible visuals of all these blue and white and red skydivers tracking off in these tracking teams, you know, way beneath me. I'm, I'm sorted, mate. I'm safe. <laughs> Watch all them land. I'm like one of the last people to land. You know, it was, it was amazing. It really was. And when we did the jump, the jump itself, we knew it. I said, we all, we all knew it. I'm going goosebumps again. You know, the jump before the 399, we kind of thought we had that, you know, but this time we, we knew it. We absolutely knew it. And it was the only day we ever did three jumps in, in, in the day. Actually, I think it was a big thing that we, we, we went from the 399 almost straight back up. Uh, to do the 400. We all knew it, we were screaming under canopy. We, I did what Kate did, which is went and landed in in, in the, like the, where the wild tie spectators were, you know, it was, it was, it was incredible. And then the scenes of celebration, Dane, Dane said he was, they were going to go in and get the judges. And he says, no, it's like with the, the Pope, with the Vatican, you know, they put the white smoke out when, when they've got it. So, <laughs> He says it would be white smoke for good or black smoke for, for bad. And then they went in there for not very long and the, the, the window opens and he's got a can of Singha, you know, the, the, uh, the Thai beer. Yeah. And he shakes it out the window so there's all this white foam, which is as near froth as you could get. And the whole place just exploded, absolutely exploded. Everybody hugging and kissing each other. There were these bins that were, were all jumping in. They were full of ice and booze and bonsai shaving a, a head, which he said she'd do if we got it. And, oh, and I must have hugged and kissed 400 people 400 times. It was it was incredible. Wow, I've got goosebumps just listening to the story. <laughs> Sorry, I went off on a bit of a rant there, but oh, I enjoyed no, it. It's all <laughs> it's all this is what we got to do in lockdown. Talk yeah. about how it used to be skydiving. <laughs> I'm watching video of how it used to be great. <laughs> <laughs> and now your skydivemag.com, a great online resource pulling out some incredible articles, incredible uh, information for people, entertainment as well. Are you happy with where it's at right now for you? I'm absolutely super happy. I'm I'm really, really happy. It's great to have a magazine that's my own. I love publishing the BPA magazine, but obviously they're the BPA, so you can't cover, oh, sorry, BS now. Uh, you can't cover um, air base or, you know, I had problems getting wind tunnel in at first. You know, now it's a magazine I can put base articles in if I like, and I can also put, you know, articles which I think are good articles about safety. It doesn't necessarily have to tow the BPA line there's a lot of opinions in, in in the world so yeah we do a safety article every thursday and i think that's the probably the thing i'm most um proud of we get loads of comments on those are really popular and you know when you get your emails from people saying i was in this scenario and if i hadn't read that article i wouldn't have known what to do you know you think that's really you know you can really make a, a difference so I, I love that last year I, I took on andrea to work with me andrea pistea she's a good friend of mine this big ways uh, love jumping with her she does two days a week for me in romania and that's been brilliant as well because now I've, you know it's like i did you know worked a bit lisa did some yeah. work with me and it's always great when you've got somebody else that you're there as a team and you're having a laugh and bouncing ideas um from each other and what i've done lately is just reduce the number of advertisers in it so rather than having lots of different advertisers i've just allied myself with the people that i think are the, the best make the best equipment in skydiving and also the people that have been my sponsors for years so then it's a very it's a very coherent message you know i believe in that gear i jump it so i'm promoting it in the, in the magazine as well and they're also the companies like pd that have the best resources you know pd they sponsor so many amazing athletes you know support flight one the pd factory team so that link also gives me great content for the magazine so it's like win 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 leslie I think that's it. Fantastic. What a I'm sorry if I've bought your readers going on too long, but I really enjoyed talking to you. It's been perfect. It's exactly what we want. Leslie, it's been fantastic to see you and have a chat. I'm, a, I'm sorry it's not face to face. We're not together commentating on an event or jumping out of a plane somewhere or doing some tunnel flying, but hopefully we will soon. I hope so too, Regan. Thanks very much. Lovely. Skydivemag.com. See you soon.